Hey everyone, I'm Deepak, founder of PMCurve.com and author of the book Tech Simplified for PMs and Entrepreneurs. In this video, we are going to talk about how to measure performance for supervised models. Now, in the last video, uh, which, which was the first video in a series of videos for AI product management, we talked about models uh, and we talked about machine learning process. Now, machine learning process comprises of training data, algorithms. Uh, these algorithms learning using the training data. And then we have a trained model and then finally we have results. Now PMs contribute a lot around the training data and the results. And we covered like the nuances of training data in the first video. We are going to cover the nuances of results in this video. Now let's get into like a little recap on supervised models. So we said that supervised models are the models which have labeled data set as the input or training data. In this case, we have the images of apples and oranges and these images are tagged or labeled with the text apple or oranges. So the model knows like which image is apple, which image is orange. And this is used as the training data. And then we have the ready-made model, which we can use to predict uh, the new images that it gets, whether they are apples or oranges. So that's basically how supervised models works. Uh, when it comes to testing this supervised model, what we do is like, even before we go into training, we take all the data, all the labeled data, and we divide it into uh, three parts. The first part is uh, the training data, which is what we have used for model to train, right? The second subset of this data is validation. The third subset is test. Now, validation and why do we need two sort of different data sets to test these models after we have trained them? The reason is because when we are training the model, we are using multiple algorithms to create sometimes multiple models, right? And validation set is a way to understand which model is actually performing or doing the task that we are set out to do. So validation helps us narrow down to the right model. And a lot of times validation also helps us fine tune the model. For example, uh, some of the parameters or features of the model might not be optimal. So data scientists use validation set to fine tune the model, right? So that's validation for you. And then the third is the test. So once you have the final thing ready, now you're going to demo it, sort of demo it, by putting the test data into it and seeing what is the prediction it is going to make on the apples and oranges, right? Now, you already know the right answer. So you are going to compare your prediction against the right answer that you have, right? So that's the testing of the model. Now, uh, rather than going one by one and seeing which ones were tagged apple, which ones were tagged oranges and all that, we actually have ways to measure performance of these models. and ways to quantify the performance of these models and that is what we are going to get deeper into this video. Let's start with the regression model. So regression model, we said that regression model spits out more of continuous numbers. For example, we are predicting housing prices. That's a regression model because it will spit out a price that it predicts for a particular house in a particular locality, in a particular year, in a particular, uh, I would say geography, right? So whatever this predicted value is, in the test data, we already know what the actual true price of the house is. And then we try to see the difference and we try to map how close the model predictions are to the true values, right? So what you can use, so over time, like we have built different methods to quantify this. The first is like performance via R squared method. Now R squared has this uh, fancy formula that you see, uh, but I think you can go and you can see this formula for yourself. We will take some sample data. For example, we have this data between Jan to August. Uh, we have sales forecast in million dollars, like this is the forecast. And we also know the actual sales. So we this is actually the test data set that we have. And then we have, uh, basically we are calculating R squared, right? And I'll show you how we are calculating R squared. So basically we use a formula to calculate the numerator, right? I'll not go into details of this because you can just Google and understand like how exactly this works. I don't want to spend a lot of time in this video explaining that out. Uh, but this is the numerator. We calculate the numerator and then we calculate the denominator. And then we have R squared one minus numerator by denominator, right? Now there is a easier way, easier way to calculate this. So if, you see RSQ, R squared, right? If I just take this and take data Y, comma data X, 
we actually have 0 0.89, right? So the Excel or in this case spreadsheet actually gives you an automatic way of calculating this, which is why I said I don't want to get into like how do we calculate it by hand because you actually don't need with the kind of tools that we have to our disposal, even as PMs. And most of the times data scientists will tell you this number, right? The only thing that you need to be is comfortable when they talk about R squared. And you should know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, right? And that, that is what we cover next, which is when we say that any, any time R squared is closer to one is actually good. Like more than 0.7 is actually pretty good. Less than 0.4 is actually considered weak correlation, right? So you are trying to get your model to more than 0.7 and somewhere like closer to one is the best. Uh, but that's how you read the R squared data that your data scientists give you, right? You don't have to calculate it for yourself. Your data science team will actually do it for you. But you should be comfortable with this number. You should be comfortable with sort of asking questions, uh, investigating more. And that is why we went a little into detail on like how easy or how hard it is to calculate this number. Now, let, th there is another method. So R squared, like spits out a value between zero to one. Uh, the other one is RMSA root mean squared error, right? Now RMSC is again, like you take actual, you take predicted, uh, you take the difference and uh, again, you raise it to the power two divided by the total number of data sets, you, uh, data points you have, and then you take a square root of it, right? So this, this is the formula that you have. Now this is an absolute measure as you see, right? Because you're not trying to get a value between zero and one. And, and we'll see this actually again, try to calculate and actually see it rather than sort of just talking it out. So, you know, uh, this actual minus predicted to the power two and we have this whole thing. We take a sum of this and divide it by uh, the number, right? We take a sum of it we divide it by count and then we raise it to the power 0.5, which is like square root of that, right? So what we have here is 2.65. Now this is, like I said, this is not between zero and one. This is an absolute error. So R squared is more of a normalized error. Now you will hear this term normalization. Don't, don't worry. Normalization means that you're trying to sort of put values uh, within a particular range. You're normalizing the value. Uh, RMSC uh, root mean squared error is more like an absolute measure of error, right? So you can look at RMSC in context with like these numbers, the actual sales, right? So this ranges between 30 to 50. Now this is a number which is like a number which is in the range of 30 to 50 and has an error of 2.5 means like somewhere around three to 4% of error that you are seeing, right? Between predicted and uh, actual. And depending on the use case that you have, you might be comfortable with it. like. Some people, in some cases, you are comfortable with three to four percent of error, like sales for forecast. In other cases, you might not be comfortable with even four percent of error, and you will say that I need higher accuracy. So let's also again tweak the model and see what it gets in, right? So we'll talk about like uh, we'll talk a little about like towards the end on how the context actually matters when we try to benchmark the performance of a model and why any absolute like benchmark for a particular performance number should not be, uh, you know, uh, taken as sacrosanct, right? So anyway, uh, performance benchmarking for RMSC, I think we are clear. Uh, this is an absolute number. There is no good or bad threshold. It depends on the range of output that you are getting, which is like the sales in this case. And you try to define error in comparison to that sales range that you have, right? One important thing to remember here is the RMSC of training and tests should be similar. It's not that the training data set is giving you an RMSC of 10 and test is giving you an RMSC of two. That definitely means that uh, there is some performance gap between the training and the test data and should be further investigated upon, right? So this actually like helps you understand, I'll just recap it for you, but this helps you understand how regression models are measured, right? They are measured in an absolute error sense by RMSC. Uh, and sometimes the error is normalized and you try to take this whole thing closer to one, something like a R squared, right? But ultimately what we are trying to measure is how close the predicted value is to the actual value. Like that's the measure and we are just trying to quantify it 
via different uh, statistical methods or via different statistical formulas. So that's basically regression models performance for you. Let's move on to classification models. So classification model requires a very different approach than regression model because in regression model, the output is very continuous. In classification models, the output is very discrete in, in like it's either apple or orange and so on and so forth. Now, the thing that we use for classification models is confusion matrix, right? And uh, this is a very simple two cross two matrix that you can see here. And what we are trying to do, we'll take an example of like, whether somebody has migraine or somebody does not have migraine. Suppose this is the uh, thing that the model is trying to predict. Now, the predicted values can be two, like if somebody has migraine or not have migraine, which is the classification. And the actual values can also be two, which is like somebody has migraine or doesn't have migraine, right? When you predict uh, has migraine to has migraine, as in like when you predict that the person has migraine and they actually have migraine, that is something we call as true positive, right? As the name said, true positive, right? If you predict somebody does not have migraine, and they don't have migraine, that is something called true negative, which is like it is the model has predictive negative and it is actually true, right? So true negative. Now let's look at like if somebody has migraine, uh, right, has migraine actually, and the model predicts that they don't have migraine. So the prediction is that they don't have migraine, which is like negative prediction, but that is false. Right, because actually they have migraine. So, which is why it's called false negative. Your model is telling you something is negative, but it is false, which is why it's false negative. And then you will get a case where people don't have migraine, but the model is predicting that they have migraine. So the model is predicting a positive value, whereas that is not the case. So, which is why it's called false positive. So ultimately, like if you look at the four quadrants, what we are talking about, it might seem confusing at first, but what we are talking about ultimately is in context of the model. True positive means the model predicts positive and it is true. True negative is model predicts negative and it's true. False positive is model predicts positive and it's false. And false negative is model predicts negative and it's false, right? So this is a confusion matrix. It's one of the most, I would say like, it's, it's pretty fancy to me when I actually learned it, right? And I was pretty excited to see something like this because it feels so beautiful when you actually look at it. Now, anyway, let, let's move on to uh, the performance. Uh, how do you measure performance using these? So you calculate these four, like true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative, and then you calculate two numbers. The first is precision. So precision is basically uh, TP by TP plus FP, right? So the first quadrant divided by true positive or false, false positives, right? So precision is basically when you are uh, of the total number of positives you predicted, right? So total number of my, suppose you said that 100 P, you predicted that of 200 people, 100 people had migraine, right? So true positive plus false positive will be 100 because that's like your model predicting positive is 100, right? So TP plus FP is 100. But suppose of these 100, only 75 had actual migraine, which is your true positive is 75. So 75 by 100, it is 0.75. Right? So that is precision. It's basically how precise are you in your prediction? When you say somebody has migraine, what is the probability that they will have migraine? Right? So that's precision for you. And the second is another beautiful metric called recall, which is of the total cases you predicted, how many cases did you miss? Right? So think of it like you predicted 75 uh, people uh, had migraine and they had migraine, but how many did you miss? Which is like they had migraine, but you said that they didn't have migraine. So suppose like 75 was the number of true positive, And suppose you missed another like 25 people, or let's say you missed another 50 people uh, who had migraine, but you said that they didn't have migraine, right? So this whole thing will become 25 by, uh, sorry, 75 by 125, right? So three by five. So the recall ultimately is saying that of the total people, uh, of, of the total actual migraine cases, like how many are you able to take out, right? How many are you able to identify? And that is called recall. Now with precision and recall, we have something called F1 score, which is like two multiplied by precision multiplied by recall by recall plus precision, right? So this number is taking into account the magnitude of precision and recall because 
what ultimately like in classification what matters to you is how precise you are but then in that when you try to be more and more precise what will happen is you will tend to miss more and more cases also right that, that is a probability that i say that okay i want to when i want to say that this person has migraine i definitely want to be sure that this person has migraine suppose you try to take your model towards that and which makes the model more precise right but what might end up happening is you will end up having a lot of uh, uh, false negatives which is basically you said that this person does not have migraine but they actually have migraine right and that that is very natural for us to understand right when we try to be more accurate we tend to uh, respond to lesser number of questions in classes right so that's basically the teacher should not just be measuring the performance of a student by of five times the person spoke how many times was the person actually correct they should also look at how many questions were posed to the person so of 100 questions that were posed the person spoke only five times of which all five times that person was correct so that's basically 100% precision but the recall is very low right which is 0.5% uh, 5% or 5 by 100 right so to have a good model you have to improve both precision and recall right and which is why f1 score is the ultimate test of classification models so that that would be basically the main thing that we use for classification models but that is not all like in regression and classification we have other methods of evaluation as well the goal was not to sort of teach you what all methods are there for evaluation the goal was to give you the most popular ones and then the building blocks upon which you can always go and you can search for this roc curve or map and sort of very quickly understand because you you now have the foundational blocks to which you can map these models right you have supervised you have regression you have classification you know how uh, their errors are measured why those errors are measured in certain way what is the good benchmark for like that particular method and now any new thing that comes your way you can very very quickly map it back to the foundation that you have right so the goal of these videos again like ai product management is very very different than uh becoming a data scientist or uh you know becoming a generic pm who also manages ai product ai product management is actually understanding how ai products are fundamentally different from other products and what all do you need to know to manage and contribute to these products to the most optimal level right so that is the key one is like you should be able to understand uh like what your data science team or your engineering team is speaking about but at the same time you should also know where your contribution lies and how can you contribute most right and we will only focus on like these two objectives uh for this video series so we are at the end of the video let's let's understand the last thing which is like the context matters a lot in benchmarking performance of ai models uh what i mean by that is uh suppose we have the context of a course and we have two ways of converting users like one course employs inside sales another course employs emails right so one in one course when somebody submits a form there is a person inside sales means there is a person who is calling them and sort of convincing them to take the course in the other course we have email campaigns which are automatically sort of getting triggered for users right we want to create a classification model for both cases right so for course one where inside sales is prevalent we want to create a classification model whether our sales team should contact this person or not and in case of email we want to create a classification model whether this person should be sent a email or not right now the purpose of both is actually converting but this is where the context matters a lot my inside inside sales call is pretty expensive because i am literally like asking a person to call this person and convince them to take a course versus email is less expensive right uh the only reason i want to do like classification in email whether i should send this person a lot of emails or drip emails or not is because i don't want to spam people so the primary reason for a prediction model which is again a classification model at email is actually to avoid spamming the users in inside sales that reason is actually saving cost for the company because i don't want to call a lot of people who are not hot leads who will not, anyway not convert and this is why like the the f1 score benchmarking for both should be different because the context is different 
for one f1 score of uh, 70% could be good enough for other the f1 score of 40% could be good enough right you have to put the context of costs conversions uh, your business model and everything to benchmark performance of ai models and which is where i said that pms contribute a lot when it comes to benchmarking performance of ai models because this is a context that data scientists don't have data scientists can improve the performance of the model continuously right but when does it become actually deployable to the end user is something that pms can contribute a lot to right so yeah that's that's basically all in this video and uh, in the next video we are going to start unsupervised models i hope to see you there and definitely subscribe to this channel thank you